The essence of technology is nothing technological. It is experience, or so a well-known philosopher once remarked. In the, in the stories that we share with you today, we're going to locate the essence of code, perhaps the most talked about form of technology in education today, in togetherness. We hear a lot about code and coding. Everyone should learn to code, or so we're told. And almost every day, there's a new app or program that will try to teach us how. With the promise of a bright and successful future, eager parents like myself line up to enroll their kids in coding camp. It is the new summer camp after all. But the danger of coding is that it can actually drive us apart, seated in front of backlit keyboards and LED screens. The stories that we're going to share with you today actually call for a very different way of imagining coding. Coding. Uh, it actually takes us away from that image and, and helps us imagine how coding could be an open and a public experience, where we do not need more new interfaces to hide code, but we need new spaces where we could come together and voice our differences. And in the next few, in the next several minutes, we're going to actually tell you how that can happen. So this is DigiPlay at the University of Calgary. It's three huge touchscreen displays, each running a different version of a flocking simulation. It's interactive. You can touch it and add more elements to it, or you can adjust on-screen parameters to change the way that they move. It's really cool, and it's fun to play with, but it's more than that. It doesn't work by illustrating pre-planned visualizations of flocks coming together. The flocking behaviors emerge from simple rules embedded in the code that tell each of the little computer birds, called voids, how to interact with each other. So the code at the heart of this simulation tells each little void how to interact based on three variables, cohesion, alignment, and separation. So if I'm a void inside the simulation, there's a number that tells me how much I should try to stay with the center of the flock, another number that tells me how much I should try to line up my movements with the others around me, and a third that tells me how close or how far I should try to stay uh, from my neighbors. And with a little click on the screen, you can open up a window with all of that code, the real open source code created by computer scientists, and you can edit it. You can change any of those numbers from five to a million, just to see what happens. You can add new code, you can take things away. <coughs> you can change it just to see what happens, or you can make it into whatever you want it to be. I have a four-year-old daughter, and I get served an endless stream of ads. Teach your daughter to code with our new product. This robot will make your kid want to code. I even bought her a Fisher-Price code pillar for her birthday. But nothing has made her face light up, like putting her in front of that real code and telling her she could do anything she wanted with it. Seeing the changes that she made embodied in the simulation was magic. This wasn't a toy or a workshop that was going to share a tiny piece of a secret language with her. I stood her up in front of the real thing and said, here, this is yours already, go for it. We learned the power of that ownership while we were working on creating another exhibit based on the same flocking simulation uh, at the TELUS Spark Science Center here in Calgary. The goal was to create an exhibit where visitors could interact with the flock, so to change the cohesion, alignment, and separation in novel ways, like with a steering wheel, uh, a microphone, or a game controller. But around two years ago, while we were piloting it, piloting it Something happened that would change the exhibit forever. Um, one day, by accident, we left a computer on with the full code for the simulation running on it. And a little girl named Mary, about nine years old, sat down and started playing with it. She wanted to turn the voids, well, which look kind of like arrows, she wanted to turn them into minnows. 
And so she sat there with us, talked about the code with us, hung out with us, figured out small things like coordinate geometry and data structuring. And she figured out how to turn the voids first into rectangles, then how to squish one corner of those rectangles to turn them into very, very scalene triangles that looked like little fish. Three hours later, the voids were minnows, and the flock was her aquarium. And in those three hours, Mary wasn't being taught to code. She wasn't being given a discrete skill that she could pick up and take with her as a possession when she left that day. She was deeply engaged in rich and meaningful conversations. Conversations with Pratim, conversations with Rob, an older student who was also working with us on the pilot. Conversations with her mother who was with her that day. But also conversations with the characters of the, of the story of the code itself. Yeah, and uh, actually the journey that Mary went on for those three hours is quite similar to the journey of the code itself, how the code got to Telus Park. It was a journey that actually took 30 years, and it begins in 1987 with a computer scientist called Craig Reynolds in the US writing the first algorithm for flocking. Now, Craig went on to win an Oscar in 1998, uh, for his work on computer visualization in cinema. And you may have seen his work. He used his flocking algorithm to create swarms of bats and birds in the great city of Chicago, I mean Gotham City, uh, in Tim Burton's Batman Returns. And 30 years later, we are here because two other people, Casey Rees and Ben Fry, actually took Craig's algorithm well, they first made a programming language called Processing. They made it open source. And then Dan Schiffman worked in Processing and took Craig's algorithm and, and turned it into Processing Code. Now, this is an important moment for us because what does open source mean? It means something very simple. It means that Craig's code and Dan's code are no longer Craig's and Dan's. It belongs to all of us. Any of us can go and download that code, make and modify that code, create and recreate that code. And so it now belongs to the public. But I want to make a point clear here. We're not saying that simply making code open source and putting it in the public domain is sufficient. As designers of technology, we also have to work really hard to create these spaces, such as the ones we have described and we will describe more later, where the public, you, us, and the researchers and, and the experts can come together and engage in a really meaningful conversation about the code. Because it is us, our experiences, that is the essence of code, that is the essence of technology. And we, so as designers of technology, we need to keep working to create such spaces where we can come together with our differences, not without them, and, and, and find a place alongside code for these differences. And along these lines, the next story we'll share actually will illustrate how our differences can come to life with code. So on Canada Day, earlier this year, we designed yet another exhibit and we gave another new life to these voids, a life that perhaps Craig and Dan had never imagined. We got the voids to record songs of thousands of Canadians and their stories and their voices. And then we got them to flock based on the pitch of the sounds in the stories that were being recorded. So there were 13,000 visitors that day. And as all of them or many of them flocked to sing their songs and tell their stories, so did their voices on the screen. And these songs ranged from Islamic prayers to jingle bells to uh, the Canadian National Anthem. It was Canada Day after all, right? And after mothers sang their prayers, they moved with their children to a side of the room where they hung out with two computer scientists, Peter and Jordan. Now these are people who actually wrote some of the code that was powering the simulation that day. And we had, just like in Mary's case, we left a window open with the code running. And so these thousands of, of these thousands of visitors, many actually went and hacked the code along with Peter and Jordan. And as one of the visitors told me later on, it's almost like I got to see how my song became the flock. 
So this is a very powerful moment for us. We need to keep designing such moments where so code needs to be reimagined as spaces where we can actually come together and voice our differences. So this is what happens when code lives in public and is cared for and curated, but not owned by anyone. It can become a public sidewalk. The kind that Jane Jacobs famously said is what turns a city and makes it a neighborhood and brings us together. So the stories that we've shared today are really three neighborhoods that we've built with code. Digiplay, Hack the Flock, and Voice Your Celebration. And these neighborhoods, they don't engulf and take over our lives, but instead they offer us sidewalks. And it's on these sidewalks that we run into each other from time to time, hanging out with strangers, or sometimes just passing each other by. And our differences, more important now than ever, can still live within the code. These sidewalks can take us to different worlds. And so Craig's boys can now sing, dance, listen to our songs, can become birds, bees, monkeys, and minnows. And to bring us together, code, and not just its products, needs to be seen, it needs to be heard, it needs to be touched, and it needs, most importantly, to be played with along with others. So as designers of technology, especially in the realm of education, this is what we think we can do better. Instead of building yet another shiny app or a new interface that hides the real code and hides the complexity, we can actually work to make it open. Because today we live in Facebook, but we don't get to see what powers Facebook. The technology that, that where we live doesn't reveal itself to us. And when we use such closed technologies, what happens is we sign away our rights willingly or, un or unwillingly. And this is the culture that needs to change. And the stories that we have shared today actually tell us how such changes can happen. See, with Mary, we had learned our lesson. We had learned that we no longer need to hide the code from the children or from the public. Instead, we need more spaces where we could come together as the public along with the experts and engage in a really meaningful conversation around code. That's the culture of publicness that we are arguing for. So we aren't here to tell you our new version of how we should teach coding. It's instead to consider how we can think and talk about what it even means to participate in the activity of coding in a different way. If we're to change the relationship that we, kids and adults, have with code, we have to think about it really differently. We have to change what coding has come to mean in our culture. Learning to code isn't about acquiring a thing. It's about participating in ongoing, meaningful, and rich conversations together. And that togetherness can mean a lot of different things. That togetherness is, is talking to my daughter and asking her about the changes she wants to make in the code. That togetherness is us talking about designing these spaces and working with our students to think about the people we want to design them for. It's also sitting immersed in someone's open source code and trying to figure out what they were thinking, looking at their half-written comments and their sometimes eloquent code. But in all of these, it's the code itself that becomes the place for that togetherness to happen. And again, back to my spiel about what designers of technology can do. We really do not need more interfaces. There is a story I almost forgot to share with you guys. A story that actually happened at the very last moments on, the Canada, on Canada Day at, at National Music Center at the Bell Studio. An 82-year-old woman walks up to the microphone and tells me in fluent English that she wants to sing a song in Polish because that's the only song she can sing. That's the only language she can sing in. And she did sing that song. It was a song that really was designed to bring the herd of sheep back together at the end of the day on the mountains, a flock of sheep that she cared for while she was growing up on the mountains in Poland. Code can be like this, where we can come together and voice our differences. Code can also be an experience like we saw with Mary and we see routinely at Hack the Flock, which is a permanent installation at Telus Park Science Center in Calgary. We see children coding for hours 
but they're not doing it by themselves. They're doing it with their loved ones. And they're not learning something, a discrete skill, like Marie Claire pointed out, that they can take and then just regurgitate. That's not the point. The point is they're engaging in a real conversation. They're having a real experience. They're engaging with the real code, with researchers, with their parents. Many worlds can collide. Many worlds can come together and coexist in such spaces. And what happens in these moments is something very powerful. The relationship that the public establishes with the code and with the science it represents, that relationship becomes a really authentic one. Not a lot different than what we do when we as professionals hang out in our labs and work on the code and work on the science. So let us learn to see code not as a shiny app, not as an interface, not as a skill to be mastered, but really let us learn to see code as a space where we can come together, be together, and most importantly, learn to be together with our differences, and we can learn to voice our differences with the code alongside experts and public alike. Coding can indeed be the next big new sidewalk. And in one of these sidewalks, perhaps our songs from Poland and the songs from Bollywood, which we all heard that day at the National Music Center, perhaps all these songs can also find a place alongside complex algorithms. And as we keep imagining these new worlds of code and we keep finding these new ways of engaging people with coding, let us fundamentally try to make code and coding just more public and more open, designed to bring us together, not to keep us separate. Thank you.